everybody to our division publications podcast my name is Gabriel Puente we have Dr. Guajardo here from the Museum of South Texas History and also the co-CEO Teresa Gatling from Viva which is yes. Village in the Valley yes. so thank you all for being here um, this is just a conversation you know about you know the, the the history of South Texas and what it has to offer and some of the information that you have as the uh, CEO president of uh, Museum of South Texas History leading up to event that y'all are going to have coming up in June. In June, yes. In June, correct. And so, um, like I said before, I'm here just to facilitate, you know, as the CEO and founder of RG Vision Publications, my job is to really promote the Valley for what it is, you know, putting the best foot forward and just giving people information about the history here. So I'll go ahead and start introductions. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Guajardo, and, and where you come from and, and your position at the Museum of South Texas History. I was raised in Elsa. I went to Ed Calchosa schools. My name is Francisco Guajardo. I uh, went away to college to the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Hilcom? Hilcom, that's right. <laughs> uh, it, it, that's an issue, by the way, because as I, you know, constitute my board, for instance, you know, I, when I first came into the museum, it, it had a bunch of Aggies. Uh -oh. And uh -oh. so you got to do uh -oh. something about balancing life somehow. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so in how we recruit, we recruit, you know, a diversity of board members. And part of that diversity means we got to have enough UT people here to kind of balance off the Aggies. Yeah. But that's kind of a good natured, you know, valley, I guess, ribbing. Uh, so I was, uh, I was a high school teacher many years ago. I, I, I then became a university professor. And I was that for 18 years, a university professor and then an administrator at, at UT Pan American and then at UT RGV. And in 2019 is when I made the transition from the university to the Museum of South Texas History, where I am the CEO there and have been for the last two and a half, almost three years. Mm. And so as, uh, as somebody who's local, who cares deeply about South Texas history, Valley history, I am a borderlander as well, so I care deeply about northeastern Mexico as well. It's part of the shaping of my own identity and my own, I think, worldview. Um, I have, at a very personal level, a deep vested interest in what this place is and how this place is talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I think a lot about the story of the place and oftentimes think about restoring mm -hmm. the place because narratives of this place are all over the place and yeah. part of that space is that they haven't always been uh, kind narratives yeah. about this place. Yeah. But uh, I, ec I echo what you said, uh, this, is, this is a place rich in history. Mm -hmm. uh, but what that richness means, I think, needs to be you know, kind of explored. Yeah, right, right. Because it's, it's a lot yeah. and, and so many stories. Mm -hmm. and, but I happen to think that within that kind of bed of stories, there's so much there that really shapes and defines who we are as a people. And, yeah. and, and it looks pretty good. I mean, it can also yeah. look really bad. Right. But I think that, that the looks pretty good, we haven't done enough to, to understand it, identify it, and then have it be part of the identity, you know, that goes out to the world. And the identity also that, that helps children understand who they are. Yeah. So it's a complex kind of proposition, yeah, but it's I, important to understand. Because I, I remember growing up, you know, in the Rio Grande Valley and not really having a true identity. You know, it, it's comprised of two counties. you got Cameron County, Hidalgo County, and then there's even Star County and Willsey County. But it's all big one metroplex. I think just recently we became one MSA. Um, it's a long time coming, but everybody was just, you know, for either from Harlingen or McAllen or Brownsville. And now we're trying to say, hey, we're the Rio Grande Valley with over like 1.2 million people here. So it's really interesting to, to see how, in, in your efforts to add on to how do we retell, I don't say retell, but I guess um, reshape that brand about the Rio Grande Valley and the people here. And that was the idea when, when I first came down uh, or moved back to, to start the publication is to share the stories of the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the people who are currently here doing some great things about it. And so, yeah, it, it uh, it's definitely under represented and it definitely needs to be you know pushed out in a different light so yeah so Teresa talk to me about uh, about village in the valley how did how did you get involved with that and how did you start that well I'm, I'm Dr. Teresa Gatling I am one of the co-founders and a co-president of Village in the Valley we've been around since February mm -hmm. of 2019 
And um, we got started because we have a, like you just said, it's 1.2 million people in the Valley. 1% of that or so is African American. And so we said, you know, we're all over the place. <laughs> We'd like to connect. And there was a time that we connected through the NAACP RGV chapter, but it kind of dissipated in 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, and we've not had another way to do so. So um, my friend Marcia Terry and our husbands, we got together and said we should do something. And what really compelled us to do so was more parents talking to us about their children saying, I don't know who I am, and we're talking children who are biracial or people, children who are black or African American, saying, no one looks like me. I, didn't, I can't find them. I don't know. I don't want to be here. I want to be to Houston. It was mm -hmm. like a constant battle. Yeah. And we're saying, but there's so many people. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't feel that way. You should know other children who look like you, be around other families. My children had that opportunity because, well, the NAACP was still running. And we didn't run it like, you know, we hear the NAACP uh, as a political action thing. It was, but we looked at it as a social kind of thing. Everybody who had a birthday, we knew about it because we had a huge database. Yeah. And so we'd go to birthday parties and things like that. So when we got together, we founded it and said, well, we want us, we want to found it on certain principles. One of those is community engagement. Another is education, uh, social connection and training, and financial literacy and empowerment. So those are the four things that we wanted to do. And I think that we've done a pretty good job at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was our mission, I should say, that would make it more understandable for what we're doing, is to connect the black community, elevating, I'm sorry, elevating and uniting the black community while connecting the cultures of the Rio Grande Valley. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we've, we've met and talked with Dr. Guajardo yeah. in the past and many others. We have a podcast that actually is talking to people about their different cultures here in the valley to try to understand it more. Yeah. Because he said, Dr. Guajardo said something earlier about children learning their identity. I, we think as a group and I think as a person that children need that identity. They need to know where they came from and that interconnection with so many other cultures, Native American, the, the Mexican American, the African American, the former slaves, and all of that is so intertwined here, and, but they don't know it. And I think because of that, we get a lot of influence from social media. I'm gonna say social media and other things that um, the kids hear it and they just pick it up and it's starting to become a problem in our schools. Right, yeah. You know, one of the things that you talked about and that I just found out, which kind of leads us into why you know we're here today is learning a little about you know, the uh, big shout out to Sabrina Walker, by the way. She's our uh, our board of advisors. She's the one who connected us, and and she was she first she was the one who first tell me about the Underground Railroad that uh, was here live about that. Can you talk to a little bit about that? Because there's some there there's a lot of interesting tidbits and facts yes. in, in about our history that I didn't even know of growing growing up here. And it was an from my understanding, it was an Underground Railroad that trafficked uh, African American slaves into our country here in the Rio Grande Valley, is that correct? Yeah, I huh. mean, it's, uh, <laughs> the, the, it's, it's really beyond dispute at this point. Um, it's, it's become, I think, a, a knowledge base that for a long time kind of resided in the family stories. Hmm. And so there are families here, the Webbers and, and the, the Jacksons, and other other families as well that came to South Texas as mixed race families uh, and and that established outposts on the Underground Railroad <laughs> this big metaphorical kind of network to freedom you know that that enslaved people became participants in and so the narrative in American history is that the Underground Railroad went to the north and so, you know, people who wanted to become free became connected with a system of homes and, and, and businesses where they would go to find refuge as they went north of the Mason-Dixon line or even went out of the country and into Canada, perhaps. Oftentimes going to Philadelphia, oftentimes going to Boston, and then, and then many times going up to Canada. And so that's the common narrative. <clears throat> it's a powerful narrative in American history, but it's an incomplete narrative. Mm -hmm. 
and, and but we've never been able to kind of triangulate the story, you know, corroborate it, that sort of thing, uh, because anecdotal evidence has never carried the water sufficiently. So, ah, those are just stories. Okay, well, yes, those are just stories, right? So the, the stories of the Jacksons that have been, uh, like uh, Nathaniel Jackson was a white man in Alabama who grew up with a little girl who was a slave on the plantation in Georgia and then Alabama. And so would fall in love with a little girl, a little girl named Matilde, Matilde Hicks. And so they would fall in love and they married in their own way. And so it was kind of a, kind of a, a common law marriage, right? Because marrying mixed race was illegal at the time. In fact, it was illegal until like 20th century in a lot of mm -hmm. parts of the country. But this is during the times of the, the, the institution of slavery. And so Matilde and Nathaniel grew up together, fell in love, had children. And then having children in Alabama in the 1840s and 1850s became untenable. So they then made the decision to leave Alabama and in 1857 brought the family with a number of covered wagons and with a number of families. And some of the families were black families. Hmm. And so they brought them to South Texas where they bought a piece of property you know, at this place that was owned by a guy named Smith, who was a merchant. Smith, who had bought the land from the original land grant owners of Narciso Cavazos, a guy who came <clears throat> with Escandon in the 1750s and then was granted by, you know, essentially the, the, the viceroy of Spain. People who came with Escandon were promised land if they stuck here. And if they stuck around, then they could petition for a land grant, a porción, mm. if you will. And so a lot of these people, Narciso Cavazos was one of those, got a big, huge plot of land. And then through the years, his descendants would then sell or do whatever, right? Or, or divide the land and that sort of thing. A guy named Smith, a merchant from Reynosa, mm -hmm. right? And it was owned the land. The Jacksons bought like 5,000 some acres from them, from Smith. Mm -hmm. And then they established the Jackson family ranch with their mixed race children. Matilde, a black woman who had been enslaved. Nathaniel, a white man, hmm. who was in love with and had this, you know, this this marriage with this black woman, and so they promptly become an outpost on the Underground Railroad. The Jacksons had been telling those stories, hmm. not with a lot of clarity, but yes, you know, Matilda is in the family, and she was a black woman, you know, and this and that, and Nathaniel was a white man, and then, but then by you know one or two generations after that, they all looked like you. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and they're all speaking Spanish, you know, and they have the name Jackson. Huh. And so there was this one grandchild named Nancy Jackson, you know, who was a 19th century character, but then she lived into the 1950s or so. And so Nancy used to tell stories to her grandson, a fellow named Ramiro, Ramiro Ramirez, hmm. who's now in his mid 70s, PhD out of the University of Michigan. He's a psychologist. Got a PhD back in 1977, grew up in Edinburgh, but of the Jackson family, Ramirez Jackson. Interesting. And so Ramiro is is kind of the the teller of the stories of Nancy, who told the stories of this place, the Jackson family ranch, you know, out at the old Narciso land grant, which then became the Capote Ranch and then became the Smith, you know, property, whatever, right? And so there's just how land changes over a period of a century and a half or two centuries or even more. So the Jacksons had been telling these stories. The Webbers had been telling the stories. The Weber, the Weber story is very similar. So you, you kind of know the story of Stephen F. Austin. So Stephen F. Austin, an empresario who brought 300 families with him to Mexican Texas. And when he brought those families, many of those families were seeking a new way of life. They were seeking land. They were seeking their own freedom. But part of the freedom they were seeking was the freedom to have slaves. Mm -hmm. As paradoxical as that may sound, but people were seeking freedom to have slaves because there was a cotton industry to be had. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have a cotton industry, you need the laborers. You need somebody to pick the, the, the crops. And mm -hmm. are you going to pick the crops? Well, maybe you can. But you know, if you have already an institution called the slavery institution, you know, you take advantage of that. And so those people were taking advantage of that. And that's why they came to Texas. They ran into a problem, however. And the problem was that 
the northern province of Mexico, a newly established country, forbade the importation of anybody who was a slave. Hmm. So the government of Texas Coahuila said to Stephen F. Austin, you can't bring in slaves. But they were so creative. They reclassified their slaves to indentured servants. Indentured servants. Yes. Okay. Ah. Huh. To be indentured for 99 years, Texas Coahuila says, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not right. Ten years. So it's a political negotiation. Well, one of those people who came with him was this woman named Sylvia Hector. She had been born a slave early in the 1800s. So she came with one of the families. Sylvia Hector would petition for her freedom after those 10 years. But it was a complex petitioning of the freedom because Sylvia Hector had fallen in love with a white man, a guy named Weber. Weber and Sylvia Hector, he was a doctor, by the way, in this uh, uh, a, a place called Weber Prairie. It's now Weberville, Weberville, Texas. So John Weber, little doctor, town doctor, who had been, by the way, in the War of 1812, mm -hmm. you know, one of those things, right? So John Weber falls in love with Sylvia Hector. They have children. He then proceeds to buy her freedom when she became eligible. In the Freedom Papers, Honest to Goodness Freedom Papers, 1834, they're at the Briscoe, at the Briscoe Archives up in Austin. In the Freedom Papers, Cryer, C-R-Y-E-R, who is selling his property, Sylvia Hector. Cryer says that, okay, you can have your freedom in exchange, however. I don't want any coin. I don't want any specie you know, monetary stuff. What I want is two of your babies. Imagine that. I want two of your babies in exchange for your freedom. It says it in the Freedom Papers. And if you do not pay up, then John Weber, you will forfeit your property. 1834. Wow. Well. The Travis County property records that historian Maria Esther Hammock has found, and I get the story from Maria Esther, by the way, and from Maria, Maria Esther sent me a copy of the Freedom Papers, and we just ordered them through the Briscoe. Freedom Papers. Yeah. So Maria Esther Hammock then went and found, she's a historian, she just defended her dissertation at the University of Texas in May of 2021. She's now doing a postdoc at Penn State, and she's going to publish this in a book. Hmm. She's got a contract with the University of Texas Press. This thing is going to retell this whole thing. And it's going to be right next to other historical treatments that are telling this story. So what the point here is that there is the family stories that we kind of believe, but not enough. Now we're seeing the historiography come out. And so this story of, of Sylvia Hector is a story of, in the 1850 Travis County property records, it shows that John Weber and Sylvia forfeited all of their property. Wow. Just to, to hold on to the... They didn't give up their kids. They didn't want to give no. up the kids. <laughs> yeah. That's not a thing you ask a mom to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So they, they, they forfeited their property, and you know what they did? They came and they bought a ranch right next to the river, right north of the river. And so you can go today to the Weber family ranch, and that's where they are buried. Sylvia Hector's buried there. Hmm. John Weber's buried there. The Weber Family Ranch. You go to the Weber Family Ranch today, and ominously looming is the Borer Wall. You go to the Jackson Family Ranch today, ominously looming is the Border Wall. And those are, in the Jackson Family Ranch, there's a cemetery there. Perhaps you've seen it. In the, in the Weber, it's only the cemetery. But they also bought thousands of acres, the Webers did. You know, John Weber tenía manera. You know, he had ways to acquire property. Yeah. So, so Sylvia Hector refusing to give up her babies is a story that I think is, is a story of American history, is a story of world history that people should know about. 
You get a story of principle, a story of action. And she then brings that value system to South Texas, and the Webbers promptly create an outpost on the Underground Railroad. Hmm. Okay. Like what? Like who, yeah. knew, who, who knew these stories, right? And so it, it, the country doesn't know these stories. The country certainly, look, I got a PhD in history. You know when I learned these stories? In the last year. Wow. So how did the, yes. the, the, the Underground Railroad, how did that develop and who started that? Well, the Underground Railroad is a very complex thing that really goes back to the early 1800s. In fact, even before mm -hmm. the early, and, and incidentally, this is really the origins of the American Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. So the American Civil Rights Movement that we know today is like the 1960s, 1950s maybe right. even, you know, with MLK Jr., you know, and, and, and even like the Emmett Till story, you know, it, it, those aren't really the, or, or the NAACP, you know, being created in New York in like in the early 20s. No, no you know, or, or even Frederick Douglass, you know, or Sir, no, the, really the civil rights goes back to people fighting for their civil rights. And the Underground Railroad has a lot to do with pushing human rights that are also civil rights. Hmm. And so now the Underground Railroad goes way back to when it became popularized. And then somebody called it this Underground Railroad is kind of this great symbolic you know, kind of term, right? And then it sort of gains traction in the media and that sort of thing. But, but what we see, like Maria Esther Hammack, by the way, has equated Sylvia Hector. She's equated her to Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, as a freedom fighter of that kind of category. And you know what? I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. Hmm. And, and so then what happens is that these two families, right, represent, and these are maybe the families that we know about because they've been telling stories, but they represent these kinds of outposts that mirror an awful lot places in Buffalo, places in the South, Virginia, places in Philadelphia, where refuge would be given to people who were running away from slavery. These places are an awful lot like that, yet they are not in the landscape in American history of the Underground Railroad. Hmm. Amazing information. So how does Viva uh, take this information and how can we get that out to the communities and also to our kids so that they can tell that story and, and maybe change the narrative you know, about the Rio Grande Valley? I think one of the things that we've done and it's so important to us is sharing these types of stories. Um, the first time I heard about this was maybe three, no, yeah, about three or four years ago that I heard about the southern route of the Underground Railroad, and I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, that existed? And then we were able to, um, we, we promoted Black History Month, we try to promote various things that have something to do with black history, but then we started learning about how black history intertwined a lot with real Grandy Valley history. And we're going, why does no one know this? Uh, so we have gone on a campaign to promote it. This particular story um, or events, uh, we were working with uh, a woman, Dr. Roseanne Baca Garza, with CHAPS at UTRGV. Um, she and her team created a documentary called Just a Fairy Ride to Freedom. It is on YouTube. It's also on our website, villageinthevalley.org. It's a great documentary that gives information about, you can kind of visually see as people are telling the stories from, you know, uh, there were descendants of the Jacksons, descendants of the Webbers, and talking about these stories. And it was very mind opening. Hmm. So we have, we try to promote that. We're also trying to get more of that into the schools because we've been hearing that there are, there's a little bit more. I'm just going to call it racial tension, but it's tension. And mostly it's because of, I think, and this is just my opinion, children who really just don't understand their own identity and the intertwining of people of color. Because we are all people of color, even if you're Angle, you're still a person of color, you know, in a generic sense. And in the Valley, it's very true because people are Angle are minorities here in the valley. Right. So they have a different kind of, we're just a bubble of, a, of, a, of our own entity. It, but when children don't understand their heritage and how proud they should be to be who they are 
and what is going on within their own community that they should know about. Another thing is like the Bethel Memorial Garden. Nobody knows about it. It was um, one of the first African-American churches here in McAllen. That's a historical landmark. The church had, was dilapidated, was destroyed, and torn down many years ago, back in the 90s, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And it became this, we got the historical landmark designation. Nobody knew about it. No one understood or knew or, or that Rest Lawn Cemetery was the only cemetery that African Americans could be buried at because it was separate. And we think separate, but equal back in Jim Crow days. And didn't realize, I didn't realize, that that meant you can't be buried with other mm -hmm. people. You got your own cemetery plot, and they're not very well kept. It's it's you know it's a whole thing. We're still working on it, but we are working with some great people. His restaurant is in Edinburgh, who really are working now to get that better. Bethel Garden has been taken over by City McAllen Parks and Rec, and they have beautified it. It is gorgeous. Now it really looks like a historical landmark. It's some place to go, and so we use our platform as a voice. We we get this information out there. We do. Um, events at Bethel Garden. We, you know, show just a ferry ride to freedom. We bring in speakers. We have a, a podcast now that we speak with people about different cultures that are here in the valley to try to help people understand that and see that we are so much more alike than we are different if we just open our eyes, open our ears, and listen and just learn hmm. because there's a lot to learn. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for coming. There's an event coming up. You want to speak a little bit about the event? I mean, you're also going to be the keynote speaker at that yes, event, right? Yes. So uh, this is to help raise funds and also awareness for Village in the Valley, right? Can you speak yes, on that? Yes, Village in the Valley. So this June, and this will be our second, which we're really happy about. It's our second event where we are having a scholarship gala. Um, our first one, obviously, was last year since it was our inaugural one. So this year, Dr. Francisco Guajardo is going to be our keynote speaker. And what we do at this event, it is a fundraiser, but we are giving out scholarships to uh, graduating seniors. And that's something that's very important to us in terms of community education. Children need to have education, and we need to help them get there. Because that's where they learn about a lot more than they do even in our public, you know, K-12. through um, they get to college and have more opportunity for electives and to learn more. And we want them to know that we think it's important. So we're doing that. So this event, um, I said it's going to be June 11th at the Doubletree Hotel. Um, tickets are still available. We're still selling tables if people <laughs> want them. Um, um, but we, you can find out more information on Village in the Valley, uh, org on our website, as well as our Village in the Valley RGB um, Feb Facebook page as well okay. and so we're just promoting education and we're going to have a lot going on there'll be a uh, silent auction not silent it's going to be a mystery box I'm sorry yeah. mystery box for um, so these mystery boxes have a minimum amount of a hundred dollars yeah well if Sabrina Walker yes. has anything to do with that oh it's yes gonna be it's going to be successful <laughs> and a live auction as well yeah. there'll be mu music and dancing and it's just going to be a wonderful time yeah I'm, I'm sure uh, so you want to talk a little bit about the Museum of South Texas History and also maybe the involvement with Viva that you've had uh, before sure. we close out? Yeah, uh, the Museum of South Texas History that's based in Edinburgh, I think, is very committed, really, to, to telling the story of South Texas and Northeastern Mexico. That is our purpose. Our purpose is to preserve and to present. And so if we have gaps in the storytelling, we want to fill those gaps. And this has been one of the glaring, you know, holds uh, in, I think, in, in how we tell the story. So we have, for example, in the 19th century exhibit, we don't have the, the word slave anywhere. But we know that slavery pushed a lot. Um, we know that this place was, in some ways, a place of refuge. Uh, because there was slavery in Mexico that was much less intense than in the U.S. Like when, when the U.S. was taking shape, there were as many as one million slaves in the U.S. When Mexico was taking shape in the 1810s and then up to 1821, they had fewer than 10,000 hmm. slaves that had been brought in from Africa or from the Caribbean who were of African ancestry. So in the Mexican experience, the, the, the institution of slavery was not as intricately connected to the economy, the social life, the cultural life, 
the political life. So for Mexico to say in 1829, we're abolishing slavery because the president was a mixed race president, by the way, Vicente Guerrero. It wasn't that much of a painful leap politically. Mm. Now they abolished slavery in 1829, but then some states wanted it, some states said no. And so it didn't really effectively across the country abolish till 1837. But in 1829, when they pronounced that edict, word got out. Word got out. And if you look at the book, 12 Years a Slave, the author writes about how he was enslaved in Louisiana in the 1830s. You can go to the book. And he says that there was chatter across the bayou of slaves plotting their escape into Mexico. Hmm. That's in that book. This whole thing of the Underground Railroad and the slavery, it's not that we didn't know. There's all kinds of evidence. And the museum is committed to it, right? I mean, you asked me what, what's the position. Well, the museum is committed to knowing more. In the 1830s, I'm sorry, when the Depression hit, <clears throat> so many people were out of work. The FDR administration passed this thing called the Works Progress Administration as part of a New Deal legislation. Within the Works Progress Administration, they created this initiative for out-of-work writers, writers, to go tell stories. And one of that storytelling project was the Slave Narratives Project. They scoured the country looking for any people who had been enslaved who were still alive. And I'm just going to give you two stories. Two, because these were published, and these, these are in the, in the Library of Congress. Hmm. Felix Haywood, born 1845, lived mostly in San Antonio. When they did the oral history with him in 1937, he was 92 years old or so, he went on and on about all these people running away into Mexico, runaway slaves into Mexico. He told that. He was firsthand witness in the 1850s, 18, 1860s. He saw it with his own eyes and then he told the story. And by the way, when they interviewed him, he was a blind man. He told the stories. Felix Haywood. It's been in the Library of Congress documentation you know, since 1937. So if somebody had found it, you know, and then said, oh, this one guy who was a slave writes, told the story of how there were runaways in New Mexico. And he said it very explicitly. He said, Mexico didn't have slavery. You could be free in Mexico, he said. Hmm. He said, me? No, I'm not going. I'm okay here. My master gives me food. I'm okay. The complexity of the institution. Yeah. Ben Kinchlow, born in Wharton County, outside of Houston, like 1843. And, and his master, his father, said to Ben's, little Ben's mother, a slave, I'm giving you freedom. Go to Brownsville or Matamoros, where Ben would grow up. Ben, in the slave narrative, when he was in his 90s, in Uvalde, Texas, that's, that's where they found him, Ben talked about when he was growing up in Brownsville and going up and down the steamboat, he, he, he talked about all these runaway slaves coming through there, through the port of Brownsville on ships from from, from New Orleans or, or by land. And he says, oh, yeah. Like he, he talks about seeing them. So we know this was happening. Yeah. And we know that family stories, the Jackson and the Webbers have been telling these stories, right? But we haven't put these things together. Not until some of these historians are going into the Mexican archives and reading in the archives how there were all these people, you know, who had things going on with runaway slaves in Reynosa in Matamoros, in Laredo, and all these places. So it was just a matter of somebody putting all these things together, which is what we're trying to do as a museum. We're putting these things together. So we have a video that we just produced that we're showing the community. So if you go on Saturday at 11 and at 2, you can view it, offer your comments, because we're doing revision and a video on the Underground Railroad into South Texas. Hmm. That's, that will be a permanent video hmm. in the steamboat in the 19th awesome. century exhibit. Very nice. That's, That's cool. awesome. Yeah. So I'll be telling these kind of stories as part of my keynote. I mean, I'll be yeah. telling other stories. It depends on the energy of the audience. So yeah. I'm going to read the audience. And which <laughs> stories do I tell? Like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and, if, and yeah. if so, then, you know, I got, I mean, I got stories to tell. Yeah. No. Because I'm, I'm, there's so is, much. 
And thank you so much for your time and also for your dedication to telling those stories and, and really filling the gaps when it comes to the, the missing history of South Texas. And thank you for all your efforts. I do appreciate all this time being here. Um, we're going to have this up and uh, we'll definitely have your websites and also everything, all information up on the pad, podcast screen, you know, somewhere when they do post it. So, again, awesome. thank you all for being here. Looking forward to the event. And uh, gonna be there? I will be there. Yay. Okay. <laughs> but thanks again, y'all. It was fun. Thank you. Thank okay. you very and much. Thank you all for, for watching. Us.